So, uh, welcome. Thanks for turning up to this, um, this session, which is about the future ways of working, and in particular about um, different models of, of actually providing uh, media services. Um, so, I'm Steve Sharman, CTO of MediaSmiths. I'm going to be moderating this panel and trying to keep my uh, fellow girls allowed in order here. Um, to my right, the lovely Leo, Leo Castley from Flix Facilities. Um, Mark, Wils uh, Mark Wilson Dunn. I always want to call you Newton Dunn because I know a bloke called Newton Dunn. Whatever suits. Absolutely. Mark from BT and um, John, John O'Shaughnessy from Doc10. So the way we're going to do this is um, John's going to give us a, a very short presentation on the way that they're looking to change the way that um, media services are delivered um, at Doc10. Um, Mark's going to follow that on with a short presentation around BT Nexus, which is a new networking offering. Um, and then we're going to take um, have a little bit of discussion here and take some questions from the floor. So um, if we're all OK, John. OK, thank you. Am I on? Yes, I'm on. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm head of technology operations for Doc10, as, as uh, Steve mentioned. And um, one of my briefs, uh, along with uh, providing all the support services, technology service for the main studio block within within Doc10 and within the Media City, is to um, okay, it's okay, um, is to also look after and manage all the network uh, that's scattered across the whole of the Media City complex. So I thought it would be first just worthwhile giving you a brief overview of what the network consists of at Media City. And here it is really. Um, basically you can see there in the studio, in the st studio block in the middle there, um, you've got sort of a number of buildings around the outside including a couple of pops, points of presence, where pretty, pretty much those are the gateways in and out and around the whole of the city. Um, you can see the fact that the, the, the POP2, for example, is on the right-hand side. That is in the building that's shared with ITV, University of Salford, etc. Um, and um, obviously the coloured lines represent the dark fibres that are scattered around the place. Some of those are 288 fibre pairs, some of the 144 fibre pairs. Some of them are, are smaller than that, really. Um, and really, this is uh, the key thing about those, those, those fibre pairs. In the, there's in the order of 20 million metres of fibre across the whole of the campus. Um, and with regards to the POPs, one of the key things is to have a resili resilience going so that actually if there's a problem with the feed going in one particular area, that actually you can get it via another area. Um, so again, diverse routes to both POPs. Generally people want GIGI standard, uh, uncompressed and uncontended across the, across the whole network. You can, we can deliver 10 GIG if necessary. Um, so that's, that's the network. Um, 18 months ago, when I, a few of us in the room, uh, were, there's only us at seemingly in, actually at the place, um, the BBC were just about to migrate across, and, and, I, and I swear there was tumbleweed across the piazza at that point. Um, it, it didn't look like a, you know, it looked like it loads does now, and in terms of residence. And, um, and just to give you an example, this slide really gives you now a, a, an overview of the residents that we currently have sat. In, in, the, in Media City. Some, most of these are actually permanent residents. Some are transient, some have come, gone, some are coming, Coronation Street for example. Um, but you can see there that there are sort of five different categories of actual residents across the whole, whole city. Um, and the services that these guys require are quite, you know, quite extensive. And uh, the, the, the key for me is by showing you the network and by showing the, 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 uh, the actual clients that now we're really trying to show you how those two come together and actually mean that because they're on the city, they're able to achieve services that they didn't usually, or are not able to do before. I should also add that actually there's a sixth category here, which is all of the rest, which is really includes all the other support services like the University of Salford, like the hotel, like the restaurants, dental services, chaplain services, you name it. Where it was 18 months compared to where it is now, it really is an emerging city. Um, so coming on to... Um, what the service models are, a lot of these service models, you look at them and think, well, actually, some of them are quite typical type outsourcing services, potentially. Um, but where this is atypical is that in a lot of cases, a lot of these actual tenants are used to keeping it close to themselves. These guys are used to keeping control of their services. Not, and, and now what they recognise by coming onto the campus means they recognise that actually they can start to push out services to people and, ba and basically pay, pay for a managed service as opposed to them actually providing that service themselves. Um, so that could include, in some cases, from a broadcaster point of view, they're outsourcing all their studio facilities, which is a very, very new way of working for them. A slight variation on that, and a more interesting variation on that, is the partial studio facilities. So, for example, because of the network connectivity, by doing collaboration uh, within, with regards to equipment, say maybe you might have the same talkback systems or the same audio systems, for example, 
you get a situation where a gallery in one particular building can be used to drive a studio floor in another building. And so it gives you much more efficiency and much more ways to do it. And we've got real live examples of that happening every week. Um, obviously that's live, live based working. The next session really is more about the more typical studio based working, which is really about rec recording from the actual um, studio into post, edit and then deliver for transmission. And really, um, okay, we do get clients come along that do want to take away things on tape, um, usually because they're posting it in, uh, in lots of other places around. Um, however, a lot, we obviously really um, try to encourage file based working. There's no reason why we can't work file based working and sit on the campus, that is our preferred way of working. Um, so for example, the, the way to work would be is to record from the studio directly file based into a server system, into a storage system sat somewhere. Um, and then really from there, there are many options, but the three main options are that actually the people that are using that media can come and actually edit in the studio facilities. And that's fairly conventional, that's just hooking up to what's normally there. Where it changes is when you start to say actually, post houses, broadcasters actually want to edit in their location. They want to be in their rooms, their spaces. But actually the storage still sits potentially with us. So we're able to offer, that's been offered and been requested to do that and we've got again examples of that we're doing today. Um, <clears throat> and the third variation really is about the transfer of media where actually when the media is actually brought, to, to recorded into the storage, it sits on our storage and then really it's only the use of parking really. At that point it then gets moved or should I say copied actually, to the whoever's, whoever requires it, the, the post house or the studio. Post. And then once we get verification that, that that copy has happened, at that point we delete it from our system. And then at that point we may never see that media again. Uh, we may actually, in the cases of the last point there, but actually maybe that they actually um, that they cut that material down and actually send us back maybe just a finished edit. And at that point we then got it in our place. Uh, and then obviously then potentially dub and, and QC and finish it and then deliver it on for transmission. So again, a different sort of way of working. A, a variation on that again is the remote edit client. So for example, uh, most of that was about studio capture, but obviously there's an awful lot of non-studio capture, PSC, location type work. It really is the same sort of model. Actually, that needs capturing somewhere, it needs centralising somewhere. And what we're finding is there's a lot of interest in people that actually want to do that centralise that storage and then again that remote edit type function where they actually just access that. Um, and link, linked in with that is the potential that they may want to actually do ingesting of their own. That they could basically, if they want to do tape ingest or other, and that really determines whether the, the workstation sits in the edit suite or whether it sits in the central point again. Really, this, but either is option. Either is available. You know, people can choose those options. Um, and another thing that we're always finding is that the classic thing with most post situations, no one's ever got enough storage. It's always full. Uh, and, um, and so quite often, especially that video effects houses, for example, that they've run on the, on the campus, who potentially may have this amount of storage, that all of a sudden they get a great job and they want this amount of storage. But they only want it for a few weeks. And then they go back down to here. And what they don't want to do is spend all the money buying all the storage. So the potential to be able to flex their storage by buying a service from, from potentially a service provider like ourselves, that is a really good option for them. Um, the second type of model really is very simple really, it's about the hosting of equipment, it's a variation of what we just said really, which basically people just said actually you know what, I don't want to build a kit in my own, in my own building, can you just host it for us, put it in, our, in your, your device and connect to it. Enhancement to that is actually that actually the, the service provider, the host provides support services and monitoring as well on top of that. Um, and then the third variation of that is obviously that actually the host provides some of the equipment or even all of the equipment and still provides that service across. So that's one, one, one type of the model. Um, the last two, obviously one of the biggest issues really uh, about file-based workflows, tapeless workflows, is the headache about how you actually do things. And most productions, you know, quite rightly and understandably, get completely confused about all of this. You know, how is it done? They're, they're quite often having to talk to a studio provider, talking to a post provider, talking to a dubbing provider, to a transmission provider. And actually, you know, it's very fractious, it's not, it doesn't work, and quite often it's wrong. And if you don't actually get the whole end-to-end -end process right, then it, it will cause great issues. And so what's now happening is that the, the services have been provided, there are workflow specialists that are now being introduced, we've got a couple, that actually will work with productions to deliver the whole end-to-end -end, uh, situation. And actually, you know, from that point of view, it means they are a single point of contact. It stops that fractious discussions. It's one part of discussion. Let, let someone else manage that for you, really. Um, and obviously, the, the usual thing about file-based delivery is that actually these people got kit on disk drives, gone on S by S cards, on compact flash cards. It's all over the place. What do you do with it? And there's a real concern about actually, usually most people want to use those cards again. So they've got to get it off somehow. 
And, and also, you may have it, you know, people got disk drives sat on their window shelves in their offices thinking, will this actually work in next year when I need it? So there's a lot of archiving services being offered where actually people are sort of really getting word now and a lot of requests and in, uh, uh, in, um, yeah, sort of emphasis about actually archiving their material off, whether it be short-term stuff because they're using it at the moment or whether actually it's deep stuff on LTO5 tapes or whatever. Um, and the last service really, which is something which is more about off-campus rather than on-campus, which is what I'm focused on today, uh, is really is that there is the ability obviously, to do file transfer. Mark will talk about a bit, a bit about this uh, shortly. Um, and there is a, you know, and, and by having that, there's a view that by having exec type approvals yeah, for things like people that uh, log on and actually look at material that sat on a central server means that actually, um, you know, they can, they can do that without physically traveling to and from the location. So those are, those are the models. I'll quickly go through some of the benefits and, and, and the sort of the potential concerns around that before Steve kicks me off. Um, the obvious ones from a, from a people buying a service point of view are the financial benefits, without any question of doubt. If you're buying a service from someone, you don't need to capex, you don't need to buy your own equipment, you provide, someone else is doing that for you. Because you're able to plus up quite, quite, quite quickly, you haven't actually got, uh, you've got the opportunity there to get more revenue in. Uh, okay, that might be shared revenue with the service provider, but it may be revenue that you would never have got if you didn't actually have those, that, that ability to flex up quickly. Um, obviously, uh, if you're not building machine rooms in your demise, then you're, not, you're cutting down things like power and heating and lighting, etc. And potentially you don't need to employ staff to, to do uh, support elements. You can buy because you're buying a service, so you can reduce your overhead as a company. Um, again, if you're not buying the kit, most people know that three or four years down the line you need to refresh it. You haven't got to worry about that because someone else is doing that for you. Um, and again, if you've got space on the actual uh, on your floor, you're paying a, a huge premium to use this space. On the, on, on your, what you don't want to do is build a, a little cupboard there with heat uh, heat generating kit there. What you prefer to do is use it for real space. I think Leo would mention they probably put an edit suite in there, for example. So you're using it for real commercial gain. Um, and obviously, the fact that you can pay and play uh, this type of service means that effectively it's risk free. Um, I've touched on really a lot of the flexibility. Really, obviously, the ability to be able to flex on demand. The, bill, the ability at the end of a, an end of a uh, end of a week when a production company says, "Sorry, we need to be in next week, even though we're supposed to be out," and you've already sold that space next week, how are you going to accommodate that? Because you don't want to turn your other client away. You've got the ability to flex on that. Um, and of course, with the with the buying and service, you've got a wider pool of support engineers. It's much better to have 10% of 10 men than 100% of one man, because you've got a much bigger pool of experience. Um, I want to put there is a potential to do a facility to facility uh, type of element. So, for example. God forbid that two post houses want to work together, um, that uh, there is the potential that if it's centralised, that can be done. It can be focused through one to the other effectively. So, so, so that's that. Um, one other thing I will talk about very briefly is that one of the benefits is that if, if you are centralising, if you're able to centralise all your resources in one central managed, monitored area, then what that means is that from a sustainability angle point of view, it is significantly better than having lots of little hotspot rooms all around the campus, which is not being managed particularly well. And the good thing about the Media City site is it's got this approval, BRIAM approval, due to all the, sort of the, uh, the because of the factors that are there, tri-gen use, and one of the interesting ones is that the, the actual water from the Manship Canal is used as part of the cooling system. And I don't know if anyone's seen this water in the Manship Canal, but actually when it gets put back, it's cleaner than it came in, which is probably not a surprise, but, you know, but, but there we go. Um, should just touch on, on the concerns of this type of model, really. Um, obviously, if you're, a, service, if you're a, a, a company that's buying services in, off another provider, one of your concerns really is about longevity of that company. What happens if that company goes bust? You've got the potential there of, of you know, risk to yourselves. Um, you're potentially putting all your eggs in one basket. So there's a question there about, actually, that if they choose to reduce their services, that affects you, you choose reducing your services. Um, obviously, if you're not buying support services, if you're not having support services and you're buying support services, you're losing the skill base of your own team and therefore that potentially is a, is a risk. Um, and again, if you've got a monopoly situation where your service provider is the only one that can supply it, then they potentially could put the prices up without your control and you're, you're caught, you're stuck a little bit there really. Um, and that's two are really important really, um, particularly that if you can imagine if you've got a situation you've got production A and production B sat in, a, in, a, in, a, in one particular uh, facility, there's a danger really that, oh, certainly from production A and production B, probably, they worry that can the other see the other's material? Can someone physically walk into the edit suites? Can, can, and, and going to the logical side of things, can the editor that was working on that production yesterday be see, see the other productions companies um, today? So there's a real concern about that. Um, and, and obviously, particularly when it comes down to things like IP. Um, 
you know, for example, it, you could have seen the, you know, it could be the latest pitch on Dragon's Den, it could be the next hot storyline on the sofa, etc. You know, IP is very, very important. Um, I, I could go in, sort of say how, from a doc ten perspective, we can mitigate all of those elements, but Steve will stop me from doing that. Um, so really, I'm just going to wrap up and pass over to Mark to say that what I've really fully effectively shown you there is pretty much a private cloud that sits on the, on the Media City campus. And by having that sort of connectivity, that actually that, and th that enables the productions and the companies that sit on the, on the city um, to actually achieve things that they wouldn't normally be able to achieve. Um, and I'll hand over to Mark now to talk about um, more off-campus based uh, working. So, thank you. Thank you, John. Well, good afternoon, folks. Uh, it's, my, it's my mic on. I feel like Madonna with this on. Um, good afternoon, folks, and thank you, first of all, to, uh, to John uh, for inviting me to use some of his time on, on this show today. Um, thank you also to the amount of people from Doc 10 who've turned up. I'm just wondering who's actually back at the ranch keeping the lights on at the moment. I think, I think everybody's here. Oh yeah, I can, see, uh, I can see all the senior folks. And thank you also to BVE North for being the first media show that I've been to anywhere in the world that has meat pies on the, uh, on the menu. <laughs> Very much a British thing. So I'm going to be really brief in terms of what I'm going to stand up here and talk about, because I think the subject matter today, which is changing the way in which the industry works, is far too important to just be a kind of a broadcast uh, issue. What it needs to be is a conversation with everybody. So I'm going to be, I'm going to be reasonably quick. Just make sure I can use the technology. Um, those of you who know BT Media and Broadcast, which is the operation that I run, will know that for about 50 years, we've been at the heart of moving content around. You know, growing up with the first broadcast television uh, and now being one of four major switching centers for content around the globe. And over the past few years, we've been the, the number one satellite provider in the world. We've pioneered facility lines in Soho. We did the first international HD transmission of live content, and that was back in 1996. Would you believe? A lot of people think that HD just suddenly appeared in, 19, uh, sorry, in 2004. It didn't. Uh, we did the first international 3D transmission. Um, so we've been moving, moving content around for a while. We were also the first people to um, put into service an IP-based MPLS broadcast network. And that's a network which can carry live TV. And I guess we're going to get a full show of hands if I ask the question, so I won't. But everybody here has seen or has Freeview at home or has come across it. Well, the great thing is the whole of Freeview runs across our network and it runs across an IP-based network in the UK. And I'll put a network map up in a, a little while, which will show that. Having proven the technology to ship live TV over a fiber network, an MPLS IP fiber network, we then looked globally, and we built a global MPLS broadcast IP network. Um, and it was quite amusing that some three years after our first customers started using it, people in the industry were still telling me it couldn't be done. So we were the first ones to, to kind of crack down that route. The whole philosophy behind what we do, though, is not based on selling fibers or wires to people. It's about connecting communities. And it's about connecting media communities. And the kind of provocation I'm going to put out, which you know, I hope will come back in the Q&A on the, the panel session, is what we're talking about here today is a new way of working. Well, it's not. It's a new way of working for this industry but it's not a new way of working for most of the, the, global, the global industries. If you look at connectivity and file-based working, the banking sector went there 12 years ago, manufacturing went there 12 years ago. Media is really being forced to catch up quickly because of the dependence on tape-based working. And you know, I first started talking about tape-based working when we launched the Mosaic software as a service platform for media workflows back in 2006, I think it was. And the industry, if you went to NAB or IBC, was full of, we're getting rid of tapes. Well, let me tell you, I still see loads of couriers going past my office in Soho with tapes. And there's still a lot out there. So there's still a, a transformation to be had. And that brings me on to Media IP Nexus, which, and I don't want to make this a sales pitch at all, this is just to put some colour behind what John was talking about. This is the 
latest generation of community networking that we've launched to try and help that tapeless journey, uh, that journey to file-based working. And effectively, it's nothing really that clever. It's actually very obvious. It's a network which connects producers, post-producers, broadcasters, content owners and content creators together. And actually more than that, it then connects them to the UK network. And more than that, it connects them to the global network. So working in Manchester or Mumbai, you're actually working as if you're in offices next door to each other. The whole purpose being to make working between the various parts of the value chain in the media industry so much slicker, so much easier. Now, we've launched this network, uh, and I'm very pleased and proud to say that Doc10 uh, in Manchester have become our first reseller. So for this area, this community, which is obviously a very vibrant, growing, and quite innovative, I must say, uh, community, Doc10 are now taking this to market for us. And the benefit for Doc10, I think to emphasize John's point, is it's taking the need for that manual intervention out of the value chain. Why? Why is that important? Well, it's important because anybody would have seen, particularly in the broadcast industry, over the last 10 years, the economic model has collapsed. You know, advertising has found many different ways and new routes to market. Um, advertising has actually grown. It's grown exponentially, but actually the, the amount of places you can take your advertising to has grow, outgrown that completely. The key is monetization of content. And if you look at everybody from a public service broadcaster like the BBC to a advertising funded broadcaster like ITV to an international player like NBC Universal or Disney, the common denominator is that they all sit on massive archives of very valuable content, which has been monetized very often only once. In a digital world where you have file transfer between post-production companies who can do something innovative with that content to make it available in multiple formats to different audiences, on demand, over the top, in whatever way, the quicker you can do that and the more times you can do that, as a content owner or a broadcaster, you can re-monetize that content and you get a new income stream into your business. For the post-production community, what it does for you guys is it takes away the barrier to entry of that dig digitization world. Because, the fr frankly, to get into the, the tapeless world, there is an investment. There's an investment to be made, as you all know, in technology. And actually, the great thing about the post-production community in this country, in Burbank, in Glendale, in Singapore, in India, is that actually it's made up of small companies who do very neat things very, very well. It's not your raison d'etre to spend money on technology unless it's technology that's involved actually in the post-production process. What a file-based environment gives you and a network-based environment is the ability to move that content around between yourselves, each other, the collaboration that John talked about, your end customer and your suppliers much more quickly and with somebody else potentially picking up the bill for building the technology once rather than everybody in this room having to build the technology many times. So, for this industry, pretty much a brave new world. But it's proven and tried. You know, if I look back to the, the 1990s when the banking industry went through it, it was called shared services. If you look forward to um, a couple of years ago, it was called outsourcing or right sourcing. And you look at it now and everybody's talking about cloud services. Okay, what it is, is actually is somebody making one investment once and everybody being able to buy a slice of it when they need it. That core network that I talked about, that's the Freeview network in the UK. That's the 10 gigabit fiber links that we've put around the UK to link basically the Freeview transmitters, but also media organizations. And then if you look around the world, and when we designed and built our global network, this is the map we kind of looked at and said, where is media produced, consumed, worked upon, resold, stored? That's what we looked at, and that's where we built. And since this, uh, this map's been put together, and I'd like to say it's since this morning, we've also gone to Dubai, and we've got two pops in Latin America, which are just being commissioned now. So effectively shrinking the world, and as I say, making Mumbai and Manchester, London and Lisbon, 
the same places. That's all I'm going to say on my feet. I mean, I hope it's going to be a, a lively interaction. I'd love to hear your questions. And again, thank you to John for giving me the airtime to, to, to speak. Thank you. Thanks, Chance. Um, that's really interesting, I think, and a lot of things that we, could, that we want to talk about probably in the next 15 minutes. But So I'd just like to bat a few questions around before we open up the floor. And um, you guys as providers have, have kind of given us some of the messages and some of the benefits. But I want to come to Leo first, because you're one of the guys that, um, that might want to take advantage of these things. So what do you think this kind of new ways of working, what does it mean to you? Um, well, first of all, we've got two facilities. We've got one in Manchester City Centre and one in Media City. Um, we don't intend to leave Manchester City Centre. We will maintain our facility there. But what's attractive about what's happening with Doc 10 and Media City is the ability to not have to invest in the infrastructure, but be able to flex up and down as and when we get productions through the door. As John has already said, um, you know, big production comes through the door. We don't need to provide a lot of offlines. We can just go to these guys and say, can you provide the storage? Can you provide the edit suites? Providing they can provide it quick enough, you know, that's always something that's going to be an issue. And there are some concerns, uh, but that would be the major attraction. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's good. John, I wanted to, to kind of throw a couple at you, which is what you've talked about there is, um, is certainly some, is a critical investment that Doc Turner are making in the future for Media City. Um, it seems to me that, that part of what that then implies is that you're going to be building a community involving all of the kind of the, the companies which are part of Media City to either kind of supply into that or, um, or to, to buy those services. How are, you, how are you going to kind of build, is that your intention and how are you going to build that community if so? Uh, well, to a certain degree, yes. I mean, the, the first point is actually there's a considerable investment already in Media City. Without any crystal doubt, the network is, is, a big, is a big part of that. It, it, without a doubt, that is a significant investment there. And part of this is about, you know, about utilising and maximising that because it just enables, uh, um, it makes it very easy to enable these sort of things. Um, obviously, that I would say that if my only client effectively was Leo, then it'd be a difficult one to manage because, because actually, for, to be able to flex up very quickly uh, and, you know, and, and only have one client is actually difficult for, for us to actually, if we've only yeah. gone by lots and lots of kit and, and more kit to make this work. Where it works for us, obviously, is the fact that actually we're getting lots of interest from lots of people. Yeah. And therefore, we can mitigate our risk by actually saying, you know, we've got to take a, we've got to take a feel for it. We've got to think, think how, what level of investment do we go into. Um, but the point is, is that we're able to actually deliver into many services. So actually, although Leo may not need it today, we've got somebody else that needs it tomorrow. Yeah. And then Leo may need it the day after, for example. Yeah. And, and I think the, um, the other side of this is, is that... Um, that f from our perspective, the, uh, the ability to sort of flex up, it obviously is going to rely potentially with us having great relationships with high companies, for example, yeah. as well. That actually, because you know, we are not going to have it all in, but we'll have good relationships and very, very quick relationships that actually these, these guys are geared up to be able to supply us yeah. when we can't supply quickly. But, but our, 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 you know, our view is that we will be able to deliver this. Yeah, and that's a, that's a really interesting point. Cause one, one of the things that came up in the session we were talking about yesterday was um, was the role of, um, of of the manufacturers and the vendors in um, in, in kind of taking us towards the, the new ways of working. So, how reliant have you, uh, or, or how have kind of your supply? I mean, we've obviously sort of heard from BT becoming part of that community, but how have your sort of regular suppliers, people like Avid, Signiant, you know, the, the guys that make up the the, the infrastructure, have they bought into this vision and kind of stepped up to help you deliver it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, when I talk about that transfer of media from from one uh, from our stories potentially to other people's stories, that is that is a, we actually use Signet for that, um, for example. So, and the, the likes of Signet, you know, the reason why we do it is, is it's the quality of service. Actually, it guarantees we know it's going to get there when it says it's there. What we sent is there, and we and we and so actually they're absolutely supporting in terms of, um, especially those in terms of obviously it's good for them commercially, but actually it's more about actually there's a reputation for them as well. Yeah. Um, but you know, we wouldn't go invest in anything. Uh, like the device of signal unless it was reliable and because yeah. and, we need that to be it, it, if, if that fails we fail effectively yeah. so um, and the same applies to storage providers that potentially you know or, or other providers whether it's Avid or whoever it is really because yeah. the storage is a solution type option doesn't isn't Avid specific it could be any you know sure. it's agnostic really and, uh, and we can just sell storage effectively yeah. uh, our issue is really is, is be able to sort of max up quickly um, but actually because we'll always have that base level which we've got to judge we've got to actually factor that in yeah. but the point is, is that because we've got the intention, and we have multiple clients, then we're able to actually gauge and, 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 and really 
help mitigate our risk, really. Yeah, no, thanks for that. Mark, just coming to, just coming to you, um, you, you talked about the kind of the BT Nexus community and what you're trying to build. How big is that community so far? Okay, so we're in uh, the initial stages of launch. So we've, uh, we've just launched the Soho Pop. So we're into around about 20 organizations currently. Uh, we had eight trialists, um, some of which were household names. And we made sure that we sweat tested it to make sure that you know, it did everything it should do. So a very large broadcaster, um, won't say who it was, um, did some very strenuous testing uh, with some very large files between London and Los Angeles to yeah. start with. Um, so they very much took us our, at our words. So we wanted to make sure it was right. We had a bit of a premature launch a while ago. Um, we went back, um, we've done it properly. It's absolutely maturing in the ground. As I say, the, the dot 10 folks uh, who are our first reseller uh, have been absolutely fantastic so far in customer engagement. So what I'm expecting to do, and I'll, I'll be very, very open, this is a community which will, will grow virally if it has value. Yep. And one of the things that we've been trying to, to encourage within the community is almost a, an Apple Apps store, if you will. So if you're the provider of a compliance service, then publish your compliance service to the community. If you're a storage vendor, publish your storage to that community. And mm. to your question to, to John, um, people like Avid, people like Signians, who, who we've had a relationship with for, well, again, since 2006, I guess, absolutely encourage best of breed to join in with the community and actually make their services available to the community. Yeah. So, you know, we, we almost step back and we become the motorway. Somebody else build all the service stations and put the cars on it, and we're very happy with that. So that sounds good. It's an interesting point you bring up there. So does your app store compete with his private cloud service? Absolutely not. We're, we're an open architecture. Um, we have no favorites, although, as, as John <laughs> said, we, we look to the people Careful. who keep, keep, out, yeah, <laughs> keep everybody on the air. Of course, Doc 10's a favorite, but that's because he's standing on my toe at the moment. <laughs> Correct. Correct. Yeah. I think just to add to that, actually, that um, with, with the Leo situation, for example, this is where the two actually come together. Yeah. So, for example, we're having a base at Media City and also a base in, in, the, in, the, in the Manchester, that potentially, if, if Leo is, is going to obviously going to continue on with the Manchester <coughs> base, then there's a potential there, actually, by the likes of Nexus, yeah. to actually link the two together. Mm. That actually we can send material from the base in Media City via uh, our facilities, via Nexus, to, to Leo's other facilities and other facilities within the Manchester community and beyond. Yeah. No, it's, it's I, I think, sort of, um, you know, just from talking to people, it, it's exciting because it, it helps to extend this idea that um, you don't have to be on Media City to be part of Media City. And I think that's, that, that's very exciting. Yeah. So that, that's good. I um, think more interesting on, is, yeah. uh, as you know, we, we're big in animation. We do a lot of animation, which the, the model in animation these days is to keep the pre and post production in this country, but outsource the animation to India, China, we're about to start work on a, a job where the animation is happening in Canada. Talking to Mark just now, you know, even though you would think we would already be able to send high-end 2K, 4K files, we've always sent them by courier to this point. So to have that super fast connectivity in Media City is it's going to be massive for us yeah. if we can apply it to that job and the cost is good. That, that, that's, <laughs> that's, a, that's a great example and I'll, I'll, I'll swiftly avoid the cost question. Um, no, absolutely, it has, to, it has to cost in and this is one of the things that we have to address in this whole digitisation argument. You're never going to get cheaper than putting a tape in a jiffy bag. You know, that's always going to be a very cheap way to do things. It's not effective, it's not particularly safe and secure, but it's cheap. Where the, where the money is made on the other side is in the agility of the, of the solution mm. and the ability, and, and as you guys in, in animation know, you'll be working with one company today and you'll be yeah. working with a very different company and a different technology in a week's time. And that ability to use the IP address almost as a postcode is the way that you introduce yeah. agility into the business. Yeah, that's a really interesting one. So, Mark, how much does it cost? Anyway, sorry. No. Mm -hmm. um, we'll open it up to the floor. Um, anybody have any um, questions or comments or points they'd like to make? I should probably say anyone who's not from Doc10 <laughs> <laughs> have any questions or comments they'd like to make? Anybody from Doc? Oh, go on, Craig. I think I'll, I'll hand you the mic. Only exercise I'm going to get today. Um, are there any plans at the moment or for the future for any basically working in the field with Nexus? So you've said there's points in Media City, but if you go up and you're, out, you're outside, obviously a lot of people want to send clips, 
straight away viewing copies or whatever. So, are there any chance for field work? There's, there's, there's two ways to address that. One is a permanent connection and, and the other is via the internet. So one of the things which is in the near term, uh, it's, it's there ready to be launched now, is the internet interface, which will allow that kind of instant connectivity. And then the other is that we're, we're working all the time to figure out news bureaus, not just here but around the world, and how we empower news bureaus more effectively. Um, so, so yes, and then when you have things like Signet running over the top of the internet, then you have your your um, connectivity, you have your security wrap and everything else. So yeah, it, it's in our mind. It wasn't the first thing that we launched, but it is absolutely in the roadmap to do. I, th I think you can complement that by saying that if it's, if it's needed now, if it's, if it's mass material that's needed now, it's more difficult because obviously the volume of the material is actually quite huge. <coughs> but actually if it's really about getting any tour of decisions made, they can actually send proxy versions of that that can quickly get to, to the base. That actually the editing decisions can be made there while that material is, is, got, is got back in another way, either, either a connection point that's, that's next, to, next to the point, or get, get it to the actual centre itself then that way it does, it, it, because of the link between the actual material, as long as those, the time code effectively are linked together, it just means it'll just relink in the system and be able to uh, pick that master material up on uh, at the end of the process, really. It, it's, it's a whole bigger question as well, because um, I was actually watching, I think it was one of the major news programmes last week, where they actually exposed something that we've all been chit chattering about in the bar for, for the last three or four years, which is the quality of, of news reporting at, um, at source actually has got more immediate but has got worse in terms of the, the video images you get back. And, and certainly um, one major corporation is looking very carefully now at how it balances that, that kind of um, immediacy to action but also with the quality which people used to get from a, from a, a broadcast. So it's, it's absolutely on our minds. Absolutely. Marvellous, thank you. Any other questions? All right. Um, in which case, I'll ask one, which is, John, you put, you put a slide up which was um, some of the, the kind of risks and, uh, and issues that, that you perceive that, um, that your clients would have with this type of approach, things like kind of single source and, um, and yeah. so on. Obviously, you've, um, you've got answers to those. So w what are the kind of the key issues and, uh, and how, how do you feel that you, you're, you're addressing them? Um, I think when it comes to uh, one of the things is, is longevity, I mean the thing for us is that uh, one of the fantastic things for us to start with is that actually um, we, we, you know, we've got a, a great backing, we've got a contract with the BBC that lasts for 10 years for starters, which is we're into the second year of that, so that's, that's a fantastic starter, so we're not going anywhere for at least nine years. Um, <laughs> And, and actually that contact could extend. So that, that would provide confidence to people who are using our facilities that actually we aren't going to be going broke. As long as we do our bit for the BBC, et cetera, then actually that, that, that's a big factor that people have got confidence there because, you know, gives, uh, um, the, uh, the second point, I don't remember what the second point was. Um, uh, a big part of it is the security. I mean, obviously what is key for us is that having workflow specialists, having media management specialists, the key really is about actually having um, initially sort of essential manual systems of actually making sure that people have got um, uh, access rights, control of access rights. But we are looking at actually an automation type system, which is our more, more uh, production intervention type systems that actually are able to manage those access themselves. So, for example, that editor A who's working on production A, for example, um, his, his, you know, it could easily be set up that his or her access times out on that particular workspace. Yeah at the end of the day. So come tomorrow, when they're working on something else, they're not able to access it because it's yeah, timed out. policy-based you know? stuff, yeah. And it's absolutely policy-based, and that's a <coughs> massive thing. And because we've got multiple clients now, we're, we're so, so, so knowledgeable about that in terms of how we, how we do that. Yeah. It's all about the workflow. It's all about making sure the media goes in the right place to start absolutely. with, and then you protect and lock down. And those are the sort of things that we do. And of course, with that, means you then avoid all the confidential IP elements yeah. as well. And, and of course, the eggs in the one basket bit was the other reference, is that, to honest, we've got to be agile. Yeah. We've got so many, you know, we've got so many uh, customers with outsourcing studios, for example. Things. We've got to be agile. It's in our uh, in our program of technical refresh, so we're continuing with tech refresh, and therefore continuing to, or will continue to improve what services we do, introduce the new services as they come, which yeah. means in theory that people using our service will get the benefit of that. Yeah. No, thanks for that. That's good. And do, do you see um, do, do you see what you do as um, kind of primarily providing those sorts of services around your kind of core studio and post type offer? Or do you see them kind of eventually coming into um, to rival other services in the cloud, like uh, Tape One, for example, A-Frame? 
Well, well certainly, I mean, our main focus has always been, uh, to start with, has been around about the, the community we're in now. But without a doubt, the natural progression for us is to expand on from that into, into much more off-campus type services. And, and we're very, very, uh, very much in, sort of in development with a lot of, a lot of areas in that, that particular. And you're right, there's, there's a few people out there, A-Frame and, and, and people. Um, but we're looking at actually doing that, again, potentially through partners, yeah. um, since we're you know, working with people. Um, and actually really, I think the key thing for us is what we're finding is that as, as, as people come on the campus or people will get to meet people, actually we're finding that it really it's a case of people are now sort of saying to us what, I, what their pain points are, how we could potentially achieve that. And by having the team we've got really, in terms of, in terms of particularly in the workflow side of things, yeah. is they're able to sit there and say, you know what, we can do this better for you. Yeah. Uh, and we can offer new services and start to introduce those in a, in a, in a gradual sense, not a big band sense, because people get absolutely frightened and are very anti doing that. Yeah. It's, very, it's a massive cultural change and, uh, and people don't want that. So it's really about little steps, yeah. um, but certainly we are looking to expand our services yeah. off campus. And you can talk about, you basically talk about how you can reduce their pain because frankly you've had to live it. Certainly have, yeah. <laughs> All right, any final questions? Any final points from the um, from the panel? Not for me, thanks. Just again, thank you, Steve, and uh, thank you, John. Not thank you, all. Steve. Gents, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. And um, well, I guess we'll see you at dot ten. Okay. Cool.